I'll be reading from the Christian Standard Bible Translation, Colossians chapter 2, verses 6 to 15. So then, just as you have received Christ Jesus as Lord, continue to live in Him, being rooted and built up in Him and established in the faith, just as you were taught, and overflowing with gratitude. Be careful that no one takes you captive through philosophy and empty deceit, based on human tradition, based on the elements of the world rather than Christ. For the entire fullness of God's nature dwells bodily in Christ, and you have been filled by Him, who is the head over every ruler and authority. You were also circumcised in Him with a circumcision not done with hands by putting off the body of flesh in the circumcision of Christ, when you are buried with Him in baptism, in which you were also raised with Him through faith in the working of God who raised Him from the dead. And when you were dead in trespasses and in the uncircumcision of your flesh, he made you alive with him and he forgave us all our trespasses. He erased the certificate of debt with its obligations that was against us and opposed to us and has taken it away by nailing it to the cross. He disarmed the rulers and authorities and disgraced them publicly. He triumphed over them in him. This is the word of the Lord. It was 2018, there was, a, there was a poll done. It was done by Legania Ministries and Lifeway Research conducted a poll and it was asked among the self-identified evangelical Christians. And the report was little shocking to know because the Christians lack biblical and theological knowledge, especially on who Jesus was. So this was the two set of questions that was asked to them. One was, Jesus is the first and greatest being created by God. And 78% of them agreed to that. And the second one was, God accepts the worship of all religions out of which 51% of the people who agreed to that. So if you know Jesus, who is Jesus and the work that he has done on the cross makes Christ and his salvation unique and exclusive. This is what we have been walking through in the book of Colossians. In Colossians, there is a flow of thought. I know uh, even that we saw from the first chapter, from words from 15 to 20 and 21 to 23, we saw a flow of thought. Paul was putting Christ supreme or he was exalting Christ from 15 to 20. And from 21 to 23, we saw that Christ was sufficient. So same way in this passage today, from 6 to 15 of second chapter of Colossians, we are going to see that Christ is preeminent and Christ is supreme. Christ is over all and he is the Lord. And from 9 to 15, we are going to see that Christ is sufficient for all our spiritual living. This is what we are going to see the whole of this passage when we walk through. So, here in, in the sermon theme, we are going to have rooted and build up. Rooted and build up in Christ is to live continuously in lordship of Jesus Christ, which is all sufficient for spiritual fullness of life. If you are rooted in Christ continuously and build up in Christ continuously in the lordship of Jesus Christ, it is sufficient for all fullness of our spiritual life. We will divide the passage into three things. One is, one is from 6 and 7, abide in the Lordship of Jesus Christ. Abiding in the Lordship of Jesus. Number two, be alert on the false teaching because this passage especially is a crux of the message of Paul he is addressing. So he is addressing to the some kind of element of false teaching which we do not know exactly but from the context we are able to understand what it is. So we need to be alert 
on the false teaching. And number three is the adequacy of Christ saving work, which is from 9 to 15. So here, in from 6 and 7, we read, <coughs> we read that, <clears throat> abide in the Lordship of Jesus Christ. Colossians has a very important Christological meaning of, of believer. So this is, you know, when we accept Jesus as our personal Savior, we receive Jesus Christ as Lord and come under the Lordship of Jesus Christ. So this is a Christological meaning that we see in Colossians. Whenever we see the Lordship of Jesus Christ, that means uh, he is a person who has received Jesus as his personal Savior and Lord. And Paul says in verse 6, A, which is, Just as you have received Jesus, Christ Jesus, as Lord. So what is the meaning of this? Though Paul, we, we understand that it was Epaphras who introduced gospel to the Colossians, even in, in the people around the Lycus Valley. He is the one who presented the gospel and invited them to believe in Jesus Christ. And here he says, Paul says, just as you have received Jesus as Lord. So there is a tradition that is, that is being confirmed here, which is, Receiving Jesus. Receiving Jesus is a technical term meaning to receive a tradition. And here it is indicates that they welcome both the person and the authoritative teaching of Jesus Christ. When they see that Jesus Christ as Lord, receive Jesus Christ as Lord, they receive Jesus as a person. And it is an authoritative teaching from the apostle. So even now today, we hold on to the word of God, which hold on to the same authority of the apostolic tradition. It has been transferred from one generation to another generation. And even Paul says, this gospel is being proclaimed all over the world. And this gospel is proclaimed all over the world, and it has come to you, Colossians. And in the same way, it is through the apostolic teaching and which we have in our hands. The, the, the infallible word of God, which holds on to the apostolic tradition. What is interesting to see here is, you have received Christ Jesus himself as Lord. It's not the word of God he is, where he is telling, or he's not the teachings that he is referring to, but he's saying that you have received Jesus Christ as Lord. The Lordship of God also the shapes the Christ identity. Theologians have caught the majestic sense of God's Lordship with the term aseity, literally from oneself. So here John Frame reminds us God's aseity is more than a metaphysical concept. It is a epistemological and ethical implication, meaning God is not only self-existent, he is also self-attesting. God is self, he is self-existent and he is self-attesting. Throughout the New Testament, we see that Jesus is presented as Yahweh as Lord, calling him as Lord, thus identifying Jesus Christ with a true and a living God. So no creature can share the nature of God. Christ Jesus is being identified as a person who shares in the nature of God. We see that in, in 9 here. We see here, that for the entire fullness of God's nature dwells bodily in Christ. Even in the first chapter, verse 11, we see, for the fullness of God was pleased to dwell in Christ. No creature can carry out the work of God. We saw a couple of weeks before Blaine preached on this, that Jesus is the Lord of creation. And he is the Lord who sustains. He is the providential sustainer. And he is the one, uh, the Lord, who redeems. 
He is the Lord of redemption. And no creation can do the work of God apart from God himself. And Christ, the incarnate Son of God, who does the work of God. No creature can receive the worship of God, the Son incarnate, who receives the worship of God that we see. We see in Philippians chapter 2, verse 9 and 11, For this reason God highly exalted him and gave him the name that is above every name, so that the name of Jesus, every knee, will bow in heaven and on earth, and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. We see clearly that Jesus is Son incarnate in flesh. When we receive Jesus Christ, we come under his lordship. At the heart of the passage, there is a confession. Christ Jesus as Lord. Second, we see here that as you have received Jesus as Lord, continue to walk in him. What is that in NIV translation which says, continue to live your life in him. So we see here that the Colossians have received Jesus as Lord and they now need to continue to live their lives in Christ. The Lordship that they have received in Jesus will confirm their thoughts, their actions, their, their attitude and all of their lives that they are under the Lordship of Jesus and so that their lives will be directed by that. So we, we, we read that in, 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 in the previous chapter, Paul has earlier prayed, when to live a life pleasing for the Lord, he is you know, giving four participles. Here, in the same way, he is giving four participles, or how to live in the life of Christ looks like, or how abiding in the Lordship of Jesus looks like. And he says in, in verse 7, being rooted in him, and being built, in, built up in him, and being established in the faith, just as you have thought, and overflowing with gratitude. So he now coming to say that, you know, as you are living your life under the lordship of Jesus, how it is going to look like, it is going to look like you are, you are rooted in Christ and your life is in, built in Christ and you are established in your faith and abounding in, in the gratitude or thanksgiving. So what is being rooted in Christ? This is a language of an heart, a hearty culture. You now the Greek uh, you know, uh, words of, of this particular phrase says, it is take root. A person who is rooted will have life and he will live. A person who is not rooted will not have life and he will wither away or he will fall away. So here in Isaiah chapter 40, words 23 and 24, we read that he reduces princes to nothing and makes judges on the earth like a wasteland. They barely planted, barely sown, their stem hardly take root in the ground. When he blows on them and they wither and the whirlwind carries them like a stubble. If Jesus is our Lord, then our lives are firmly rooted in him and we live. When we are not rooted, what happens when the wind blows? When, when the problem comes, when the false teaching comes, because we are not rooted in Christ, we fall away. There is an imaginary, imaginary or a metaphor that we see in Psalms 1. Those who are planted in the, in the streams of the water and there is a chaff which, which blows out. There are a plant which is, which, is, which is solid and takes root in the living water, stays and lives and others don't. And what is being built up? Built up is a language of architecture or construction. So this here, the people of God are built on the foundations or the apostles of, or the prophets. In Ephesians 2.20, we see this. So if we are 
under the lordship of jesus if you are abiding in christ then we are built on on the the prophets or the or the foundations of the apostles and the prophets and what it is looking like you know what what do we understand and how do we apply this passage in our own lives now there are two things that we can understand one is abiding one is abiding abiding is being rooted and being built up believers can live lives that reflect the lordship of jesus only by remaining so how can we how can we live a life that is worthy of god when we have a true relationship with jesus when i know who truly jesus is when i am truly connected to him we know the metaphor of this abiding very you know well known passage that we know is you know john 15 where the branches are 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 remaining with the with the um the branches are family rooted to the vine so we know that unless the branch is abiding with the vine it cannot give fruit so unless when we have when we abide in the lordship of jesus when we know who the supreme lord of the universe is when we understand the preeminence of christ is when we understand who who is all over the world who holds the authority then i you know we remain in his lordship then our lives will will bring in fruit here and second one is we see that in 1 peter chapter 2 words 5 your life you yourself as living stones a spiritual house are being built to a, to be a holy priesthood to offer sa- spiritual sacrifices acceptable to god through jesus christ so this is again stone upon stone stone upon stone built on are built up as what as a place of spiritual worship the the the, the worship is not in a, in a place of of coming and gathering here but it is a metaphor that each and every person who comes under the lordship of jesus christ is a person who is being built as a person who would who would be exposed as a as a spiritual worship place or a spiritual sacrifices as a priesthood so in ephesians 2:22 we read the same thing in him you are also being built together for god's dwelling place by the spirit of god the spirit of god calls the believers and he builds stone upon stone if you have received jesus as your lord what the spirit of god is doing is he is building one one of you as a spiritual place of worship you and i are being built on the spiritual place of worship the so number 2 is what it is looking like how can we apply this passage as our own life is is strong foundation being built being rooted and being built is a is a metaphor a joint to describe the solid foundation upon which the believers lives are built it shows the stability of the believers in christ before he moves on to the false teaching he wants to show that if you are rooted in christ if you are built up in christ you will be stable you will be firm and he says in in 1 corinthians chapter 3 verse 6 to 11 i will read the last words according to god's grace that was given to me i have laid a foundation as a skilled master builder and another builds it but each one is to be careful how he builds on it for no one can lay any foundation other than what has been laid down the foundation of jesus christ jesus is building his king we are building his 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 church or he's building stone upon stone and that stone is strong foundation who is the strong foundation it is jesus himself this is what paul is laying down none other than jesus christ himself 
and there are other two participles we saw here being rooted being built up and being established in faith and here we saw here is you were taught the language of a law court room or it is confirmed being established is something similar to the way that you call being confirmed what is to be confirmed because of being rooted and built up leads to consolidation of faith you are rooted in christ and you are built up in christ and so you are established in your faith and progressively reinforced in the christian conviction or solid ground faith as which the object of belief the content of teaching ephaphras has faithfully passed on to them faith is not blind faith is not something that you know you believe god but here it's very clear that ephaphras has passed on to them as jesus is lord jesus is the lord the lord of creation the lord of redemption and he says that abide in the lordship of jesus if you see christ as supreme if if you see as christ as preeminent if you see christ overall then our lives have to abide in his lordship we need to live a life in christ so that our life will be in strong or we won't be you know unstable during the time of problem or the confrontation of the so called false teaching here now we pass on to the next words be alert on the false teaching so he says to them that be careful that no one takes you captive through philosophy an empty deceit based on human traditions based on elements of the world rather than christ so believers who have received jesus christ as lord be careful on false teaching false teaching is real and it has been generation after generation the church of jesus christ is fighting with there are many false teaching which is coming again even in the first century second century throughout the ages and whenever the the church is confronting with a false teaching they come up with with the confession of faith it is real false teaching is real and he says be alert on false teaching why be on guard otherwise you will be taken captive if it will be if you are not unchecked would overturn the gospel and bring the colossians into spiritual bondage if you are not going to be alert if you are not going to be awake and aware of the situation you would be falling into a spiritual bondage you would end up in captivity it is something like robbing the greek word is which is similar to a hijack of a ship you would be taken into captivity spiritual captivity so what brings the bondage is the content of the teaching through philosophy and empty deceit by human tradition and elements of the world so here no one takes captive you do not know how many of the false teachers were there in colossians who were influencing the church for the spiritual bondage for this kind of heresy but we know that you know there are you know it is very you know it is very uh, we do not know exactly what is happening it is very ambiguous when we go through the text thomas uh, shriner who says it is a mystical teaching a mystical teaching that promises readers fullness of lives apart from or going beyond christ and another person another biblical scholar right says wrong understanding of the meaning and application of the old testament law for the new age this appears to be a erroneous uh, jewish doctrine that focused on the old testament law instead of christ as the epitome of divine revelation 
And one more person, Arnold, who says, false philosophy represents a combination of Phrygian belief, local folk, Judaism, and Christianity. You know, we have, you know, different kinds of interpretation of what this false teaching that is ruining the church. Where Epaphras has to go back to Paul and say, you know, our church is going through these kind of problem. I would go on to what Wright says. You know, I will, I will read again. Wrong understanding of the meaning and application of the Old Testament law for the new age. This appears to be erroneous. Jewish doctrine that focused on the Old Testament law instead of Christ as the epitome of divine revelation. Why do I say that? False teaching as idolatry. False teaching as an idolatry. In verse 2.22, we read that, do not handle, do not taste, do not touch. All our Old Testament shadows particularly of the food laws or human commandments and doctrines which we read in even 16, a clear language of food laws and Jewish calendar. This is an allusion of or a reference to Isaiah chapter 29 verse 13 where he says, this people approach me with their speeches to honor me with lip service, yet their hearts are far from me, and human rules are direct to their worship of me. These people are coming to me to honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. Their worship is something like this. Human rules are, are human rules and human regulations. The Colossian text likely links to such a commandments and teachings taught by men to empty deception based on human tradition instead of Christ in Colossians 2.8. Paul says commandments and teaching of men associates with false teaching with idolatry. Even when you, when you see throughout the, the, from 16 to 19 and slowly when you, when you go back in the, in the letter, we see lot of things which are related to the ceremonial law of the Old Testament. Ceremonial laws like do not do this, do not eat this, I know about the calendar of the Jewish festivals. But he says in 220, if you have died to the elements of this world, which he refers to idols, why do you live as if you still belong to the world? You have already accepted Jesus as a Lord of your life. Why do you again live for those elements? In the inaugurated age of fulfillment, it is the idolatry to substitute the shadows of Christ. For Christ, who is their eschatological substance. This is by G.K. Bale who is saying that. Christ is the one who is the substance. We read that in words, word 16. Therefore, do not let anyone judge you in regard to the food and drink or in the matter of festival or a new moon or Sabbath. These are the shadows of what was to come. The substance is Christ. In Old Testament, we see that, that the shadows of things, the ceremonial laws, and, and, the, and the things that, that is attached to the calendar, Jewish calendars, these are, all, these are all the shadows. But the substance has come. Christ has come. When, when the, in, the, in, the, in the new age or in the new covenant, when Christ came into the world, now he, the Christ has fulfilled all those things. Why you need to go back and follow that? Or why you need to go back and follow the rituals again? It can be a shadow of Christ or it can be Colossians 3, 5. Even Paul says, sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desire, greed, which is idolatry. Even which is idolatry. So, you know, each of us have our own idols today. I know the idols may be different for, for each one of us. So here Paul says, you know, these people are, are going back to the shadows 
these people are 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 being uh, being you know greedy so which is idolatry what is taking captive of you today what shadows of christ that is limiting the worship of christ today or is it materialism that loses your eyes or the hearts which is which is taking you away from the lord christ is the one whom god exclusively found and the one whom the world was created and through whom the world was redeemed and the one whom the world was defeated by the the hostile powers were defeated it was christ so any teaching that is in a way that distracts christ exclusive role is ineffective and wrong the false teachers are arguing that certain practices must be added so in order to achieve true spiritual fulfillment but for anything addition means it is subtraction one cannot add to christ to the saving work of jesus your life and my life is rooted and built up in christ your life and my life is being rooted and built up in jesus under the lordship under his lordship and thirdly we will see from 9 to 15 the adequacy of christ saving work if jesus is the lord if jesus is the supreme ruler of the earth and heavens if he is preeminent in all things then our lives are satisfied in him if we don't have satisfaction if we don't really have contentment in christ then we don't really realize that jesus is supreme christ is supreme christ is over all so here paul is coming to say that he 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 puts on that jesus is supreme and now why he is supreme the adequacy of christ saving work that we see here a christian is fully sufficient in the person and the work of christ and this is enough for salvation for all our spiritual life what is required is the to know christ to know the work of christ when we understand that clearly it fulfills all our spiritual need we don't need anything beyond that we don't need anything added to that christ is sufficient to us the false teachers argued that christ was insufficient and they went back to the human traditions and elements of the world they replaced christ or added with materialism and rules in this passage paul brings in the exclusivity of christ why christ alone can save us why is christ exclusive why jesus alone can do this why christ is unique we'll read that here in 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 the in this passage we'll divide the passage again into 3 9 and 10 as christ in all his fullness and from 11 and 12 believers are united to christ death burial and resurrection and the third one is the third one is believers are united in christ triumph which is the last 13 to 15 so why jesus is sufficient why he alone can save us in 9 and 10 we read that for the entire fullness of god's nature dwells bodily in christ and you have been filled by him who is the head over every ruler and authority you were also circumcised in him uh, sorry so 9 and 10 christ in all his fullness number 1 christ shares god's nature from the negative not according to christ 
he's now flipping to what is according to Christ. He's trying to explain that. What is according to Christ is the fullness of God. In, in, in 119, we read, God was pleased to dwell in his fullness in Christ. The divine nature of God, we see that the divine nature of God, it is there in the Father, it is there in the Son, and it is there in the Holy Spirit. And Christ shares the exact nature of God. And God is one. God's nature is one. And he exists in three personhood as Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. And here in John 1.14, we read that it is the word became flesh. Not the divine nature or even the father or the spirit. What the church call, it is the person. It is the person. Jesus Christ, the son incarnate, who is the, the full nature of God, the entire nature of God. He, he is God. Christ shares the entire nature of God. Christ is God incarnate in flesh. The divine son dwells in a body. He who united to human nature, that is flesh, and now Christ subsists in two natures. That is, the Christ nature is he is God. And now in this we see that, in this we see 9, we read here that for God's entire fullness of God's nature dwells bodily in Christ. So the entire fullness of God, he came down and he resided in Jesus Christ. This is incarnation. This is incarnation. In the Old Testament, the dwelling of God was in temple or in tabernacle. We can tie that with the presence of God. Wherever the tabernacle was moving, the presence of God was moving. And Solomon prayed and the temple of God was filled with the presence of God. But here, John, here we see that the inaugurated kingdom of God, God dwells in the body, which is the replacement of the temple with Christ as focus for God's presence. So God's so where do we have the presence of God? The presence of God is not in a temple. Jesus told the disciple, Jesus told, you destroy this temple, I will raise it up on the third day which he mentions that it is Jesus' body is a temple of God. The presence of God dwells in Christ's body. And here D.A. Carson puts it like this, how the word which was God in the very beginning came into the sphere of time, history and tangibility. In other words, how the Son of God was sent into the world to become Jesus of the history so that the glory and the grace of God might be uniquely and perfectly disclosed. The rest of the book is nothing other than the explanation of this theme. Amen. So here, the, the, the glory of God and the grace of God might be uniquely and perfectly displayed perfectly disclosed. So when Christ, the divine incarnated Son of God came into the world, the, the grace of God has been perfectly poured out to the people of God. This is what we see in the next one. Believers are filled from Christ's fullness. When Christ came into the world, when Jesus came into this world, Bodily, what happens, filled with what? All the fullness of deity resides in Christ. Believers who are in Christ 
are filled. This is what we see in John 1.16. Indeed, we all have received grace upon grace from his fullness, filled with the grace of God. God, in his divine mercy, when in his fullness, when he came into this world, and when we behold his fullness, when we behold his fullness, we receive his grace. When we see him as the Lord of the creation, when we behold him as a, the supreme ruler of the whole world, when we see him as the Lord of the Redeemer, we receive grace upon grace to our own self. This is, you know, abiding in, in, in Christian in, in, in Christian lordship, in Christ's lordship. So, number second one is, believers are united to Christ's death, burial, and resurrection. 11 and 12. We read here, you were also circumcised in him with a circumcision not done with hands. By putting off the body of flesh, in the circumcision of Christ, when you were buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him through faith in the working of God who raised him from the dead. Believers, if believers who have come into the lordship of Jesus, who have been united with him, who are built up in him, they are united in Christ's death, his, his burial, and in his resurrection. So this picturizes the, the old life is gone and the new life has happened. So the believers, the believers are, are in, those who are in Christ, if you see that, you know, the, the following words, most of the words are in Christ, in him, and all those things which refers to that, as a believer in Christ who have accepted or received Jesus as Lord, are, are united with him in his death, in his burial, and in his resurrection. What does that mean? This, this shows that there is a need for Christ's death, burial, and resurrection. There is a need. Why God has to die? Why Christ has to come, die, and resurrect again. Here we see that by putting off the body of flesh, there is something putting off the body of flesh is happening. Why that is happening? Why there is a need? Why it has to happen like that? We see here because of the first Adam's sin and brought sin into the world. And humans are under the wrath of God. The Bible calls for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Romans 3.10 Adam sinned and turned the created order upside down on us and brought death, which is 6.23 for all. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus. What is God's response to our sin? What is God doing in our sinfulness? We cannot save ourselves. In due time, the last Adam came into the world, who is fully God and fully man, who obeyed for us and satisfied his own righteous demand on the cross by dying on the cross and, and raising on the third day. The need for Christ to come is because of our sin. And because of our fallen humanity nature that is in us, that he has to come and he has to take up the punishment of the cross for you and me. And he died and he rose again. Christ's death brought stripping off the old self and its power. So he says here, you were also circumcised in him, with him with the circumcision not with hands, by putting off the body of flesh. And in the circumcision of Christ, if you are a believer, if you believe in the Lordship of Jesus, then there's something is happening here. 
the physical circumcision is a sign of covenant between his people and God in Genesis 17:1 to 14 we read that in the old testament there it was a covenant between the god's people and in the old testament also it is a metaphor that moses calling it circumcision of the heart a day which is going to come that god is going to circumcise the hearts of people and in deuteronomy 36 the lord god your god will circumcise your hearts and your descendants and you will love him with all your hearts all your soul so that you will live paul takes this concept of non physical circumcision performed by the spirit of god which he calls not done by the human hands but it is made of god what is that in romans 6 6 we read that for we know that our old self was crucified with him so that the body ruled by sin might be rendered powerless so that we may no longer be enslaved so that we may no longer no enslaved to sin conquering the power of sin takes place when a person come to christ the body ruled by sin is stripped off or put away so in the death of jesus christ when christ died on the cross for our sin what happened the sinful nature of the sinful nature of the body which is controlled by the power and dominion of sin was stripped off and god did that on the day that we received jesus as my savior and lord this is conversion and entry into the kingdom of of heaven and this is what happens when a, a person believes in the lord jesus his body of sinful nature has been chopped away and and god is clothing him with his burial and with his resurrection a new life in christ and and the third one is the symbol of baptism baptism here he says when you were buried with him in baptism in which you were also raised with him through the faith in the working of god who raised him from the dead what is baptism here baptism is a symbol of our death to the old life when we were plunged beneath the water and the resurrection to the new life we raise out of the water here it is referring to the water baptism are you in in romans 3 in uh, here when you were buried with him in baptism in which you were also raised with him through the faith in the working of god here when we read 11 and 12 together we read here we locate when the circumcision happened in in 121 in 12 yeah he says we read when you were buried with him in baptism so when does the circumcision of heart takes place it is in burial when we accept christ when we are buried along with christ when we are raised along with christ in the newness of life the by the power of god through the faith god has given us by as a as a gift what happens here new life comes in so this is baptism baptism is is a whole life is gone and a new life has come in so the third one that we see here the final one here 13 to 15 believers are united to his triumph the christ triumph what is that christ brought triumph by erasing the certificate of debt and defeated the rulers and authorities because of our trespasses we were dead in our sin we read from 13 to 15 and when we were dead in the trespasses in the circumcision and the uncircumcision of your flesh he made you alive with him and forgave all our trespasses he erased the certificate of debt with its obligation that was against us and opposed to us 
and has taken it away by nailing it to cross he disarmed the rulers and authorities and disgraced them publicly he triumphed over them in him believers are united to his triumph how this happens he says there are six clauses he saying because we were dead in our trespasses of our sin but god made us alive that the, the new life that we have the christian life that that we have is a divine activity god made us alive and here he says how he made us alive by forgive forgiving us all our trespasses all our trespasses whatever that we have done from all our life has been forgiven that means how much joyful a person can be so he made us alive because he has forgiven all our sin because the striping off of our body that happens on the death of jesus and because of his burial and his resurrection god's wrath was satisfied completely we don't require an old testament shadow in all that christ has fulfilled in him god has fulfilled the plan of salvation and erase the certificate of debt erase the certificate of debt that means you know here is a good news the complete forgiveness of our sin you had an i o u creator you had an i o u create i o u that is you know i o to god where you owed his perfect obedience and you failed this is your certificate of debt the law of god with its legal demand stood opposed to you but christ took it and paid your debt on the cross the the certificate of debt has completely erased all that you have done all the sins that you have done all the things that you have been you know doing everything has been completely erased by the by the completed work of jesus on the cross what a savior we have and how he did it he nailed it to the cross dear friends there is a payment there is a payment for that it was not easy it was our hands to be punished it is our hands to be to be nailed our legs to be nailed but it was jesus who took our punishment he took our punishment he substituted us while dying on the cross for for yourself and myself and also the last one he defeated the rulers and authority this is something like this god in christ stripped off the controlling influence through the power of cross and the enemy is conquered how he is doing that this is like a roman soldier riding with a chariot and his troops leading defeated kings and his enemies behind him bringing the spoils of the war we were fighting for a wrong kingdom but the enemy was defeated and god has taken us like a spoil he has taken us together that we belong to him that we belong to christ he was stripped of the power and we belong to christ and christ alone dear brothers and sisters in christ and paul shows the supremacy of christ paul so shows the 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 preeminence of christ and he says he is preeminent he is supreme and he is the lord and your lives are are in rooted in christ and your lives are 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 built up in christ and when we are rooted and built up in christ continuously we live in the sufficiency of christ we live in the sufficiency of christ may the lord grant us grace to continue 
to live our lives in Jesus. Shall we pray? Father, we are so thankful for your word. Lord, your word, Lord, is truth. And Lord, your word creates. And Lord, your word reveals. And Lord, even now as we, Lord, look into your word, Lord, we pray that, Lord, it would create in us a new heart. It would create in us a desire to love you supremely more than the idols that is catching our hearts, the jaws, the lucrativeness of the world, the power of the world, the money that is in the world. Lord, may you reign supreme in our hearts that, Lord, we will fall into your feet and say that Jesus Christ is is the Lord of my life, and we live for him and him alone. Help us, O Lord, in grace. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.